God have a vision, the vision to save the world, and this vision is revealed to all of us. We should see through these eyes of faith the plans that God has for this world. We have to see with eyes of faith the vision that God has for this world. He have a dream when he create this universe, and he have a vision to put a man in this world to increase in number and fill the earth. But because of the sin, instead of increasing the number of children of God, evil was increasing in the world. Now, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we can see God is turning again on the vision that he have for the world. And as we see today, the scripture, God wants to give us this revelation, all his vision that every one of us could be involved and every one of us could have its part differently in this universal vision that God has for the world. Of course, God has every person a diff for every person a different plan but we don't know the plans that God has for us we can take in advance from the Bible what the plans is for uh, the church in a common ground but individually every person has responsibility to find out what is God's plan for each of us so as we continue in this study we are now in the second part of the chapter 2 of the book of Eds and we were talking about this the synopsis of these four chapters that we see the ministry of the Holy Spirit as a ministry of patience, the ministry of preaching, the ministry of power, and the ministry of perseverance in the church, the first Christian church. So we already talked about patience, about how God uh, wants to persevere praying until we receive the power from above to testify to the end of the air. We're talking about this, the verse of a Christian and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the responsibility to all of us receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit every day in our life for preaching, for making, for seeing and making miracles in, in among us and for persevering in times of trials, temptation and persecution. Now when the Holy Spirit came in Pentecost Day, the Holy Spirit, as I said, poured out the characteristics of the church. In other words, the Holy Spirit gave the DNA of the, that the church needed to start his ministry. So as we continue developing this uh, teaching, let me continue sharing what are the characteristics of this DNA of the Holy Spirit. And the first characteristic of this Holy Spirit DNA is unity. So unity is the power to pray. Pray for God's power was the, uh, the reason for what the members of the church on the Pentecost day, they were waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. As we see in verse 1, they were all together in one place. They have all one reason to be together. What was the reason? To receive the power from the Holy Spirit, the power of God. The second characteristic of the church must be communion, where everybody can, sorry, communication, where everybody can speak everybody language. As I said last week, we have all kind of different people, doctors, engineers, teachers, uh, telling people, not telling people, and everyone can reach another person that have the same category or the same uh, working field in our life. If you are a student, you can reach another student. If you are a man, you can reach men. If you are boys and girls, you can reach boys and girls. If you are doctors, professionals, you can reach those kind of people. If you are just a housewife, you can reach another neighbor housewife and talk to them about the Holy Spirit. Talk to them about God. Talk to them about the power of God. Because everyone who is filled with the Spirit, they have the ability to speak the wonders of God according to the vision that God gives to every one of us. The third characteristic of the church is a vision. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Vision is to employ everybody uh, talent, every member talent. Every church member have a talent, at least one talent, said the Bible. But we have more than one talent. We can do more than uh, the, the talent that we have. And we can air more talents if we wish to work for the Lord. So, as it says in verse 17, in the last day, God poured out the Spirit on all people. And they have the talent to prophesy. And to see visions and dreams so the dna of the holy spirit contain a vision for the church and a vision that everyone can receive as the parents for a family they pass to their children the characteristic the genius that they need for their growing their uh, personalities and characters so this holy spirit give to us the very day of pentecost day the vision that the church needs for the future of the same 
The next one is prophecy. Prophecy is to devote to God's word. In verse 18, we see that all servants, men and women, they receive the Holy Spirit to prophesy, to tell to other people uh, what the word of God said, what the Lord said. In the, New, in the Old Testament, the prophets, they always speak on God's behalf. They never spoke in their own uh, uh, reason or their own uh, uh, plan. They always say like this when they start to prophesy. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. This is what the Lord says. They never say, this is what I said. They always quote God. They never use their own words. They quotate the words of the Lord every time that they address to the people. And that's not the power that we need. We have to know the scripture well. And when someone asks us for a counseling, asks us for a recommendation, asks us for uh, help, we can have one word that we can share with them. And we can say, well, this is what the Bible said. This is what the Holy Spirit said. This is what Jesus said. This is what God says in his word. And you can counsel, you can teach, you can share with other people what they need to learn from the Lord. The next characteristic of the Spirit DNA is fellowship. So fellowship is nothing else that love one another deeply. But we have this fellowship in the ministry of discipleship. The Holy Spirit wants us to have a fellowship by having a discipleship too. In verse 42, we see that they devoted themselves to the apostle teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So part of the discipleship is not just study the Bible, it's to have fellowship, it's to also share the bread, it's to also pray together. That's part of this discipleship training. Then, fellowship also involves generosity, the ministry of being generous. In verse 44, we see that all believers, they work together and they have everything in common. Generosity have in common everything. That's what leads us to this part of this fellowship, communion. In verse 46, we see that every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts and they brought bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So the fellowship that we need in church is not just to listen a sermon, it's not just to have a Bible study, but it's also to share life together. We have a tea time after service every Sunday here, but that's not enough. We need more than that. We need to share every day our life. To, to be generous to one another, in pray, not only in prayer, but also in time. How much time we dedicate to each member of our church? That's one homework I want to give you this week. How much time do we dedicate for each member of our congregation? So we cannot see a real fellowship in church if we don't spend time generously to other members of the church. Then the other characteristic of the church is passion, to worship with joy. The Bible tells in verse 26 and verse 28 that there... The apostles and the, the disciples of Jesus, they, with glad hearts, they rejoice continually as they gather together. They say, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoice, my body also will live in hope. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Better 47 and 40, 46 and 47 say, every day they continue meeting together in the temple core and they ate and brought the bread with glad and sincere heart, with joy, with praising and enjoying the favor of the people. When you see joy in a service, you see the favor of the people to everyone. It's, it's, it's pathetic to come to church and see that everybody who are, come to church, we can have a solemn time of worship, but if, when you come to try to find a fellowship, it's pathetic to see that many people are depressed in the worship time, or they look depressed. Maybe they are not, but they look depressed. Why? Because they don't see the joy of the Lord in their hearts and in their faces. So we have to develop that kind of talent. The talent to see a joyful service, rejoice and smile to everyone, at least, without passion. We cannot be filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't have passion to worship. We don't have passion to come to church. We don't have passion to evangelize. Then our faith is, it looks dead. Even though it's not dead, it looks dead. And nobody wants to follow that kind of passion, right? But if you see people passionate, you see people dedicated, you see people welcoming and embracing everybody with warm heart, they want to follow, even though they are a set. You know why Sin Chi have a lot of members? Because they, are, they have passion. Why mommy church, they have a lot of members? Because they have passion. Why Ijerog and all this Pakunso and all these heretics here in Korea, they have a lot of members because the members have passion to even teach the Bible wrongly. They have passion to do that. And people, they don't care what they teach. They take care about the passion of the people because they want to motivation. They want to follow example. They want to see other people push them into an atmosphere that they can forget the problems of their life and they can forget about the, the, the challenge that they have for tomorrow and they can even have a hope to see that if they 
gather that, that meeting, they can receive a new hope for a new day that is coming in their life. Passion is what we need. And passion also brought us to compassion. Because if we have passion, we also need compassion. Compassion is to be willing to sacrifice. Verse 44 and 45 again, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. They gave any, to anyone as he had in, in need. So they, they were not hesitating to be generous. They don't hesitate to share. They have compassion to one another. It's not because, okay, that's your problem. It's not my business. So it's according to your faith. God is blessing me to me because I, I, I'm okay. And, and probably you have a problem that God is not blessing you. No, they don't have that kind of mentality. They share to each other. They, they have compassion. They have passion to share. They, they were generous. And they want to be a witness also to each of them. Verse 41 said, Those who accept his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Verse 47, And the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. Who give the fruit of be a witness? Who give the fruit to testify? It's the Holy Spirit. It's God who bring people to the church. But we have the responsibility to testify, to be a witness. In other, in other words, to become friends of Jesus and bring more friends to Jesus. That's what I was teaching this morning to kids. How many Christian friends do you have? And how many non-Christian friends do you have? And what do you want to have more? More Christian friends or more non-Christian friends? More friends who have faith in Christ or people who deny the faith of Christ. So if you want to be around more people of faith, you have to make more Christian friends. And how can you do that? Having compassion, testifying, be generous to them, and showing passion in their life. So this is the kind of picture that we have to see in our church. Otherwise, we are condemning our church to die. We are condemning our church to have less and less members every week. As we continue studying this book of Ed, that is the Ed of the Spirit, today the scripture teaches about visions and dreams that were prophesied for the prophet Joel. Let me ask you this question. Have you arrived to your vision? Have you arrived to your destination? I mean, do you know what is the purpose of your life? Do you know why are you here in planet Earth? Do you know what is the, the, the reason for your living? If you don't know what is a vision and you are confusing about what is a vision, let me explain to you first the definition of vision. Because vision is not a goal. A goal is an objective. Okay, my goal this year, 2018, is to lose 10 kilos. But that's not my vision. That's not the reason I'm living. It's a temporary object or objective. So I'm reaching for that. I make sense for it. But that's not the reason of my life. That's not my vision. A vision is not also a mission. Some Christians confuse. They say, oh, my vision is to, to go to Africa and preach to the, to the, the, the people in, in the jungle. No, that's the call mission. That's the calling for mission for the church. That's the fulfillment of the great commission that God gives to the church. It's not the vision that God wants you to have. It's not your personal vision. That is the commission that we have. Every Christian have that commission. So it's not yours. It's universal. So vision is the reason of why you were born. Your vision is something that you are he here and nobody else can fulfill that vision except you. God didn't create you just to fill an empty spot here in planet Earth. It's not because he needs one more person and he just put you there. He created you because he has a plan for your life. He has a vision for you and he wants you to know that vision so that vision becomes yours and you live for that vision every day of your life. That is the reason that you wake up every morning and you say, did I arrive to this vision of my life? If you say yes, then that's the last day of your life. But if you just know that you are not yet there, then you have to pray to God every morning and say, I want to live for this reason today. I want to live for this vision today. And Lord, let me know that I still have time to go to that vision that you give me, that dream that you have from God. Joseph, in the Old Testament, he had 11 brothers, and he shared his dream to them. It was a vision from God. It wasn't his dream. It was God's dream for Joseph. He didn't understand what the dream was about. It was a vision from heaven. He saw the sun and the moon and the stars worshiping him. And he didn't understand what that means. He shared to his father and his mother. They get upset. He shared, he shared to his brother. They tried to kill him. Because that vision wasn't from him. It was not a worldly vision. It was a heavenly vision. And we can see as we started the book of Revelation last year that this vision was fulfilling in the book of Revelation too. And in the temporal way, in the temporal time, the span of time that Joseph was in, in this air, 
he saw one practical way to put this vision in practice again in his life. How? To becoming a leader for the world. In that time, Egypt represented the capital of the world. And everybody went to Egypt to have some kind of education, power, food, etc., etc. And Joseph, after years of training, he became the second in the government in Egypt. For what reason? To save his own people, to save his family, and to save the world too. So Joseph, that comes from the name that also had the same root of Jesus, who means Savior, is the, 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 the Old Testament figure of Jesus in the New Testament. Because Jesus came to us, and we, his brothers, his family, denying and tried to kill him and even kill Jesus. But then Jesus, he, became the leader of the world, became the king of the world. And now he's ruling in every one of us, giving and sharing his vision to all of us. So, how many of us understand how our vision is connecting with God's vision? In the Old Testament, we see many people who have visions. And all the visions that the prophets have in the Old Testament, normally they, you can see the prophet have a vision for condemning the people of God or to bring judgment, the announcement of judgment to the people of God. But there are some visions in the Old Testament who are connected with the New Testament that is the point of why we are here today in church and why we are here today in this time of history under the blessing of God. And let me go back to Genesis again, the beginning. When Abraham, he took... And God, God to Abraham outside of his tent one night that he couldn't sleep. And Abraham couldn't sleep because he had so many blessings. God given a promise to Abraham to go from his hometown to the land of Canaan. Then Abraham put in his life a purpose of living. Okay, I have now a goal. I will go to Canaan. That's my destination. I will go to Canaan because God ordered me, commanded me to go to Canaan. And he went to Canaan. And in the way, he struggled with Egypt, pharaohs, and all these things. But he arrived to Canaan, blessed. And he had all this blessing. And then he finally, in the promised land, in Canaan, he found out that that object of his life was not the reason of he was created. Okay, God, I have so many blessings. So what? I'm here in the promised land. So what? This is all? This is all about? That's why you bring me here? No, that was not God's vision. That was just an object. That was a temporary goal. That was not the vision of God for Abraham. That was not the purpose God was uh, creating Abraham. So Abraham said, then why am I here? Why am I here if I don't have a child? What am I here if nobody going to inherit what I receive from you, God? Who? My servant going to receive this? Everything that I collected from all these years, all this blessing, all this money, all these properties, all this land is just for my servant, for my neighbor? Who going to follow me? Who going to inherit what I believe? What I receive from you? To whom I'm going to share my faith? Then God took Abraham out of his tent and said, Okay, you want to talk to me in a dream? Let's go to dream together. He took it outside and said, Abraham, look at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to Abraham, So shall your offspring be. In other words, Abraham, he was so disappointed about himself. He worked so much the entire of life making a house, making uh, his house be ready to have children. But now after working so many years, so hardly for having this facility, this accommodation, this beautiful house, he cannot give to anyone. And of course he was too old to try to make a child. His wife was also too old to try again. But God have to show him this picture of many stars and say that these all stars are like your children's. And, then, and Abraham probably have this conversation with, with, with God and say, these all are mine? Yes, these all are yours. Now, parenthesis. Abraham thought he would make all of them. But he just make one or two with Ishmael. He thought that he had to make all these children's as he saw the stars. But what God is showing him was a vision, a motivation to live one more day of life. His body was decayed like an old man. Now he said, wow, I'm going to have so many children. Okay, let's go back to the gym. Let's go back to exercise and call to his wife. Okay, let's going to have a date again. And they make again the effort to bring a child, even though we're almost 100 years 
Another vision we see here in the New Testament, we're going to talk about later. In chapter 10, God showed a vision to Peter. When? When Peter was praying. He was praying and sleeping. It was noon time. You know, noon is in Spain, it's siesta time. You know what is siesta? In Spain, when after lunch, everybody goes to sleep for two hours at least, or sometimes four. And people go back to work 2 p.m. or 4 p.m. in Spain to continue their journey every day. So they have a sacred siesta every day in Spain. If you want to, to sleep like a kindergarten baby in your life, go and work in Spain. So Peter probably he thought he was in his siesta. And he was sleeping and, and praying at the same time. It was too hot, probably. And there he went to the roof. And with this fresh air as praying, he probably had this dream, this vision. And there what? He heard the voice of God, and the voice of God said, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Peter replied. I had never eaten anything impure or unclean. What Peter was saw was a, 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 a cloth coming from heaven, and inside this cloth so many uncleans and uh, kind, many kinds of animals he's never seen before. And God said, Kill them and eat. Now, you just know what the uh, dieta or the diet of, of just people, they don't eat the, the kind of food that we eat here in Korea, right? They don't know what is real food. <laughs> but Peter, for his first time, he saw this kind of food and, and what? He said, I never put this in my mouth and I never have this unclean food. But God responded to him the second time and said, do not call anything impure that I have made it clean. Now, what kind of vision is this? Abraham, he saw that he will be the father of many nations. And he believed and God justified him. And he, that's why he became safe. He promised to, his name will be great. And through him, all the families of the world will be blessed. Now, Peter, who was a Jew, who received the gospel from a Jew, who is Jesus, he now have a picture of the entire world community of God. Representing this time in animals. And God said, now, share with this have partaking of this feast but peter couldn't understand the vision he couldn't understand what god wanted to tell him and god said well i'm giving you the opportunity to have connections to connect with all the world and to have a opportunity to experience all kind of fellowship with all people in this world and then the story said that peter was called by the roman so a centurion whose name was Cornelio, and he preached to his family, and the family of Cornelius was saved, and also they were filled with the Holy Spirit. But then, the vision doesn't finish that. There's another vision here. In chapter 16, the apostle Paul, he was evangelizing in Minor Asia, and he had his route, his plan, his itinerary, he had his agenda. I want to go to this, this city, that city, that city, and then I will come back to Jerusalem or Antioch at this time. He had a perfect plan to go to evangelize. But in the middle of this journey, God showed him a vision, another dream. And he showed in these dreams, in this vision, a Macedonian man. The scripture said in 6 and 9 that during the night, when he was dreaming, Paul had a vision and a man of Macedonia standing and being, begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, in the scripture, we don't see that there were a Macedonian who really appeared to him and asked him to help him. It was a dream. It was a vision. And, was the, and that was the reason that the Apostle Paul, he changed his itinerary. Maybe this word is for, this, for you this week. If you have a plan this week, pray first. And be filled with the Holy Spirit and let God lead you in your new itinerary this week. Because maybe there's a better way to glorify God's name this week. Maybe God have a better plan for you this week. But you need to dream God's dream. You need to understand God's vision. There's someone who needs your help, but you don't know. They never ask you, but you have this vision. They're asking you for help. They're asking you to share the gospel. They're asking you to share the good news. They're asking you to share your life with them, to be generous, to, be, to have communion with them, to have a vision with them, to have fellowship with them, to have unity with them, the DNA of the Spirit with them. You need to have this vision to see that God is putting you in a position that you can have a global or international global vision this day from the place you are. Even though you are just in, in your house as a high, uh, housewife or you are just a student in the middle of high school, you can have a vision today that will touch the nations. You don't need to go anywhere. With the technology that we have, with the internet, you can be here and in America at the same time. You just need a 
line of internet to connect with the world. But you need admission to know what God's plan is for you and how he wants to use you. He trained you. He formed you. He gave you all the talents that you need since you, the time you were born to this point to use you. You just need to dream and develop this vision that God has for you. Now, how we develop that vision then? The way you can develop a vision is first, you need a unique mind. You need to have a unique mind. You need to believe that you are the only person in this world that God needs. Yes, sounds selfish, sounds arrogant, but that's the way it is. If you think that you are the only person that God needs right now in this moment, then you have to accept that responsibility and that vision and say, okay, God, here I am, use me. Because God has trained you for that vision that he's given to you. Nobody else can fulfill your vision except you. And people have to recognize that vision in your life. Even though you don't share, people say, I think you were born for this. People will come and say, I don't know, but I think God created you for this purpose. People will come and, and praise to you. He will, they will come and they will tell to you, hey, I don't know what you have, but I think that you are good in this. And nobody can do this job like you. Nobody can study in this way like you. Or nobody can do this or that like you. You will see that people will recognize the vision in your life. That only you can do it. And you will humbly say, no, it's, it's nothing. But no, God trained you and prepared you for that vision. That only you can do it. Second, be creative. You have to be creative. You have to, to probably read so many books. You have to probably watch movies or, or, or interact with people. You have to know the world. God is a designer and He designed everything in our life. We just need to find the track, the path that God made for all of us to walk. And we can enjoy that path. If we don't do that, we're going to die frustrated for living a life that we don't have any meaning on it. So be original. Be creative and let God inspire you. People need examples in this life. If you are inspired by God, you will inspire more people. But if you are not inspired by God, who can follow you? What can example you can give to your friends, to your uh, uh, children's to the people who wants to follow you third take records of your vision make records of your vision see how you are progressing in your vision how God training you and what are the plans that you have to achieve that vision Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 said then the Lord answered me and said write the vision and made it plain on tables I'm reading the King James Version it's not NIV that he may run who reads. Write the vision and made it plain on tables. Take records of your vision. So everybody can see, oh, you have a vision. You have a clear mind what person you want to be. What kind of life you want to live. You are not here because you are you mechanical. Going to have a career, get married, have a wonderful family, have a nice apartment, a nice car, and then die. No, you are created for more than that. You are created to have influence in this world. You can be... A rich person in dreams there's many people who are very very poor that the only thing that they have is money they are very very poor that the only thing that they have is riches in this world but they are poor in visions they are poor in dreams they just know how to accumulate money that they are very poor in their life they have no meaning in their life but you can find a person who is rich in dreams who have visions for his life and he's the most happy person in this world and he bring many people with them. So, let's have a filled spirit vision. The scripture of today says that in the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters, will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, will pour, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Yes, we can prophesy, we can dream dreams, and we can see visions. God is in love. Of your dreams he's in love of your vision why because he didn't create you for that he is very happy to see how you go to that destiny how you are going to that end of your life and he will welcome you and say well done well done faithful servant well done enter in the joy of your Lord enjoy now the eternal life with me you have done your job in earth your vision has the seal of God, He is behind you. He, he's supporting you. And the character of you who have such a dream is in it. God's DNA with your DNA is connected in the spirit. And you both are partners in this vision. You just need to 
keep dreaming and keep going to that vision. Have you stopped to dream? Have you stopped to have vision? Well, this is the time that you have to reboot again your vision. Reboot again your dream. Have a dream first. Then visualize your future with that dream. And enjoy every day of this journey of your dream. If you do that, you will be more than conquered in Jesus' name. Let's pray.